Okay, and they say, now you may tell the story you wanted to tell. Uh, I've been sending out emails and I'm grateful that you all responded by signing up for tonight. And in several of those emails, I shared that I would share a story in which I was shaken in my shoes, scared in the last month. And that doesn't happen to me very often, but I'll give you the backstory. And I know Lynette had a similar experience to this because when I shared it with her, she shared a blog that she'd actually written about when she did the same thing I did in a different location, in a different way. Maybe some of you will as well. So I am about an hour from the Idaho-Montana state line. And right across the state line into Montana is one of the top bike trails in the world. It's 15 miles long. It's mostly gravel. And it starts at the top of a mountain and it's 15 miles downhill at a very gradual slope. 3% grade because it used to be a railroad track. And it goes through, I think, 10 tunnels and seven across seven trestles in the middle of nowhere. It is really remote. No buildings, no phone signal, but very popular trail. So lots of people on bicycles. But the first tunnel is the longest one, 1.7 miles of tunnel unlighted and unpaved. So it's gravel and along the edges of the tunnel are two ditches filled with water. So you better stay in the middle of the tunnel and all you can hear is dripping water. And when you come out the other end, your back is all sloppy because the tires have been sh shooting mud up your back the whole time. So they tell everybody, bring a strong bike light and wear a coat because it was really warm outside, but the second you get in the middle of that, the inside the tunnel, it drops to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm sorry, I'm talking in miles and Fahrenheit for those of you outside the country. I hope you can do the, the translation, but 40 degrees is chilly. So we all stopped. We were with our friends, Karen and Mitch Crawford, who were visiting. We stopped and we put long sleeve shirts on. We went to turn on the lights on our bikes and they're pretty new bikes. And we didn't realize we had to recharge the lights. So the lights are as dim as possible. Mine went out as soon as I got in the tunnel. So you start and at a mile point seven, you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. It is as black as possible. And you can occasionally see other people coming the other way, a little light coming at you, but suddenly, my arms were shaking because I couldn't see. All I could see was the dimmest outline of Mitch, the lead bike, but I, because he had a little bike light, but I couldn't see Karen, who I knew was between us. And I could hear Ty behind me. And I keep saying, Ty, can you see me? And he says, barely. And I said, I can't see Karen. Karen, keep going or I'm going to hit you. It, I was really close to panicking because I knew I had to keep going or people were going to hit me. And I had to keep going because I had no choice. I had to get out the other end. But my arms were shaking so much that the bike is going like this. So what have I learned to do? Ask my guides for help. So I'm saying, guys, where are you? I can't see. I need your help. Guide me through this tunnel. And they said, start singing. So I'm singing a Carrie Underwood song and I'm singing very loudly, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> it was basically should have been Jesus, take the handlebars. But I just kept thinking, why is nobody else freaking out? Because Ty is fine behind me. He's, he could barely see me. But to ride a bike in the black and know that I could drop off into the drainage ditch on either side, I just kept saying this has to end eventually. Finally, I saw the light at the end of the tunnel. It was still another 10 minutes. It was 20 minutes in the tunnel of pitch blackness and just waiting. When I popped out the other end, I recognized that's trauma. I have just gone through trauma. And what I learned was you go downhill and they get put you on a school bus and ride you back up. You don't have to ride back to the beginning, but the bus drops you off at the end of that tunnel and you have to go back through it to get to your car. So all I'm thinking is, how am I going to enjoy 15 miles of this ride knowing I have to do that again? I don't want to do that again. <laughs> but I just kept asking the guides, why did that happen? Why was it? I don't remember it being like that when I did that 10 years ago. 
But we had two more tunnels to go through and they weren't as long. You could see the light. I, I put up with it and we're about to start through the fourth tunnel. And Mitch says, okay, everybody, you ready? Sunglasses off. And I went, what? I was wearing my sunglasses, my very dark sunglasses the whole time. And nobody told me, Suzanne, why are you going in with your sunglasses on? And that's when I started saying to my guys, why did you not tell me? And they said, because your fear took over so much, we couldn't get through to you. But there was another lesson, which I will share with you. On the way back, well, you can bet I took them off for every tunnel through there. We also figured out a way to turn our phone spotlights on and kind of stick it in our shirt. So we had a little bit of light. But on the way back, it was such a different experience. I could see the floor. I could see the curved roof. I could see the ditch that somehow spirit kept me from driving into. I honestly... I was going to say, I don't know how I got through it without running into a wall and breaking my neck, but they said, we've got you, right? We've got you. And that's why my arms were shaking so much. My body wanted to go like this, but spirits fighting the body, trying to keep me safe. Amazing. So Lynette had the same experience, a terrifying drive in the, in the night one evening and got all the way home petrified and realized she was wearing sunglasses, but the absolute blinded me. So the next day, I got a message from my guys. Where is it? Here, I'm going to read it to you straight from Sanaya because it really applies to all of us. Ah, expanded or constricted, the choice is yours. You are not a thing. The body which houses you is an apparent thing relative to your true state, which is awareness with a capital A. Awareness can be adjusted like the lens of a camera. In that meditation we just did, we expanded our awareness. We opened the lens of the camera. Awareness can be colored like the lenses of a pair of dark glasses. You can choose to change the aperture on a camera. You can choose to remove the glasses. You can choose to see the world through the narrow darkened lens of thinking and acting as if you are only human, or you can widen the lens and take off those glasses for the least filtered, least constrained perspective of all. And from this more exalted point of view, there are no bodies. There is no separation. There is only what you may call light. We call it love. The choice in how you see is yours. You are so very loved. And this just goes right back to that question from one of you about, you know, is that a choice when I'm going down a dark path? We can, with awareness that we're going down a dark path, take off the sunglasses, the filter of our human patterns and the way our thoughts color the way we see the world. And then <clears throat> we don't have to be frightened anymore. That frightened part that came from the programming in the physical body. Oh, that's really good insight that I'm getting right here. You have this part in the brain called the amygdala. It is absolutely programmed to keep you safe. Fight or flight. In that case, I was in full flight mode and couldn't shut it off as long as that threat was still there. And the threat was the newness of total darkness and people around me. And so that overwhelmed soul awareness, even through two more tunnels. <laughs> but just train yourself in being as aware as you can when spirit's trying to talk to you. And I, why I, okay, there it is again. I was like, why didn't you tell me before I went in the tunnel to take the lenses off? And they said, because then you would not be teaching this lesson now. Uh-huh. Okay, great. <laughs> anyway, I hope that's just uh, illuminating for some of you. Okay. And we did say we were going to talk about reality. What is real? I've talked about this before. 
but it really bears repeating because so many people say, well, I'm making that up or that was a dream or was that imagine my imagination when I had that experience? Oh, perfect. I get it now why we just did that meditation. That place you created is very real and it's your reality. Just because the rest of us have not and may not ever visit your space doesn't make it unreal but you co-created it with someone in spirit and it's real to them. Trust that. And the more you spend time in it, the more real, the more solid it becomes to you. You're creating a pattern and that becomes a neural pattern in your physical system so that you can go back and repeat that very easily and just drop into that space at any time. It is very real. Does it exist? Absolutely. In consciousness, we think that this reality is real because it's solid, but it's only solid to us in, at this level of reality. To those in spirit, it's not solid, yet they see it as real. And their reality, as Brenda's saying to me right now, is very real and solid to them. Every reality is relative. So the more time you spend in that space you just created, you will have different, very real experiences and they may become even more sharp and clear until the point where you are actually sure that you're smelling real sense and feeling physical presence because it's real. So what do we have here? I think another message from Sanaya about that. Reality is relative. What is true to one person may not be true to another. You live in shared realities, much like multiple dimensions. Each is real to those living it. Keep in mind, there is only one truth, one ultimate truth. And I know we could all state this in unison. I am. That's it. The truth that all there is, is pure being. That's God. And then God bursts forth and creates realities upon realities and beings within those realities. And here we are as spirit having adventures. So it's all real because it's all created in the consciousness of spirit. And anything that can be created in consciousness is real. And it all can help us grow and learn and feel more connected with each other. So when we ask, is it real? What you're really asking at the human level is, are other people having this experience as well? That's what you want to know. That doesn't make it any less real if others don't share your reality. So is it helpful? Is it healing? That's really the question that helps you more than, I don't think that was real. That experience you had in meditation, absolutely real. As is this world, as is anything that arises in awareness because there's ultimately only one mind. These are, these are ways of practicing being like Gumby. <laughs> flexible, flexible in our awareness. We get stuck in this reality, this objective world and think it's the only reality and we limit ourselves. I know some of you had a breakthrough this evening and met a loved one that you didn't expect to in that meditation or met a loved one that you did expect in that meditation. If you didn't tonight, you will have it. And the more you practice shifting your awareness and visiting realities beyond the shared one that 7 billion of us are having in this physical world, the more you'll come to realize you are like Gumby. Flexible awareness. Why? Because we all arise from the one awareness that knows I exist. I am. Everything else is story. And God loves a good story, right? And sometimes they're scary. Sometimes they frighten us to death, but there is no death, right? Okay. Hope that's helpful. Wow, wow. Well. So... Oh, it's so important to understand this reality thing as we, we go through the drama that we have in our world right now. Look at the divisions in our world. The Israeli reality versus the Palestinian reality in the U.S. You know, 
the reality of one person's candidate versus another person's candidate. Is the other viewpoint any less real? No, it becomes one's truth, but that truth is relative. Always come back to the one truth, I am. That's even higher than the soul's level because even the soul is a bit of a story. It's less, res it's less restricted than the human story, the soul, but expand the soul to all infinity, infinity, and now we have just one mind without a story. If we could make our decisions based on expanding our awareness and encompassing other people's stories, we wouldn't lose we wouldn't become so frustrated with each other, lose patience with each other. And we might be able to say, wow, maybe I don't have the whole story. This is the challenge with our media today. It's become so polarized that we only get one aspect of a story. So how do we know the whole story? I said to somebody the other day, I wish I could sit down with some of our candidates and know them at the heart level to really hear them and know them. We can meet them soul to soul in meditation, but that's that's a pretty advanced process. Most of us won't have that choice, uh, that ability right now. But just know that you are always seeing the world through other people's lenses, the sunglasses, and through your own. And we all have different lenses. When you get stuck in only one view, you are really limiting yourself. So hopefully that will help you navigate the drama of all the stories in the news easier now and find greater understanding, find greater compassion. And that comes when you get above the story, but it's all real. It started from a conversation on what is real, all of it, but is it ultimate truth? No, it can't be. There's only one truth. I am the rest of the story.